So folks, this is just for podcast subscribers. If you want advance notice on the roundtable live discussions at WSB with gubernatorial candidates, all you need to do is text the letters WSB to 345 345- 345. Text the letters WSB to 345 345 and you will get the advanced invite to come hang out with the gubernatorial candidates in 2018. Good evening. It is 510. I hope you're wading through what remains of the snow out there. It was really beautiful over in Carroll County this weekend. Oh boy, we'll get to that. But first, <coughs> excuse me, let's get into the uh, attempted terror attack in New York City. And first note how very interesting it was that the media first wanted to call the person an attempted suicide bomber. And then they would say, well, it was just a pipe bomb. For the record... He attempted to strap a pipe bomb to a vest and blow himself up. That is a suicide bomber. Uh, They were also referring to him as a Brooklyn resident. Uh, This is much of the mainstream media this morning. A Brooklyn resident. It wasn't some hipster in skinny jeans and flannel trying to blow himself up. It was a Bangladeshi immigrant who happened to live in the Brooklyn area attempting to blow himself up. He was unsuccessful. And the poor dude could have been uh, killed by commuters who were livid that their commutes were delayed by this nut job trying to do this. I mean, people were livid that they had stopped the trains in New York City. Nothing's going to stop a New Yorker from getting where they want to go, and including this guy trying to do this. It was absolutely a crazy scene this morning in New York. The A, the C, and the E trains in New York and Times Square were shut down. This guy, the pipe bomb, did detonate. It injured him, burned him badly. He is still alive. And this is one of the most interesting things here, is that we now have two terrorists in New York City. The man who drove the van up the sidewalk, killing eight people, and this guy injuring himself, all of whom, uh, they're both alive, so they can both be interrogated. And this is the thing. I realize this looks like a policy failure, but to a large degree, this is a policy success. And what I mean by that is we are dealing with individuals pledging their loyalty to ISIS, trying to go it alone. And the reason we're doing this is because the Bush, Obama, and Trump administrations, all three, have been very successful at annihilating the organized infrastructure of ISIS. Through destroying the organized infrastructure of ISIS, all they have left are these supposed lone wolves. Now, not all of them are lone wolves, but the more people they talk to and plot, the easier it is to find them and eliminate them before things like this happen. And those who go it alone, as we're seeing, largely are incompetent. This guy didn't do a very good job building his vest, which is a good thing. And because he is alive, we will be able to interrogate him and we will be able to find the sources of information through which he got the information to build his bomb, see where he got it, and begin monitoring those sources so that we can detect similar patterns in the future as other people begin to buy certain things to build bombs. But there is a tangled public policy issue here we need to discuss that the White House is flagging as of five minutes ago in my email inbox. This is an email I just got from the executive office of the president. Um, This is from one of his senior staffers. Let me read this email to you. In the last decade, the United States has resettled nearly 142,000 Bangladesh nationals on the basis of familial ties. That is a population larger than the population of Dayton, Ohio. A significant driver of this influx of family-based immigration is chain migration, the process by which foreign nationals permanently resettle within the U.S. and subsequently bring over their foreign relatives, who then have the opportunity to bring over their foreign relatives until entire extended families are resettled within the country. 
President Trump has called on Congress to end chain migration and eliminate the green card lottery. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has echoed the call, explaining that lawmakers must end chain migration exchange for any deal granting work permits and federal benefits to illegal immigrants under the age of 36. In other words, the president is saying today, if you want a deal on DACA, you've got to end chain migration. And he's using this situation in New York City today in order to do that. This is going to be an immigration fight. And again, what do I say all the time? Those of you who are regulars, you can you can repeat it after me. Events change things. There is statistically a Democratic wave building for Congress. We are seeing it in special elections. We are seeing it in local elections. We are seeing it in, in state elections in Virginia and elsewhere. There are warning flags. There are donor problems within the Republican Party. There are big problems. We'll get to Roy Moore's race in a minute, uh, which concludes tomorrow. There are some troubling polls out for the Republicans in Alabama tonight from Fox News and others. But th there is a Democratic wave coming. And uh, this is to be expected, not because of Trump, but because the Republicans control the White House. As much as the Democrats want to make this about Donald Trump, the fact of the matter is the Republicans control the White House, and the party that controls the White House typically sees the congressional elections go against them a little bit in their first term in office and overwhelmingly in their second midterm election. This is the president's first midterm election. George W. Bush is the only president going back to Ronald Reagan to see the tide go in his party's direction. And his was because of 9-11. This doesn't amount to 9-11. But immigration was an issue that motivated massive numbers of people to support Donald Trump. If the president is able to harness the chain migration issue and show that Democrats are being negligent and jeopardizing national security, they may not be able to reverse the flow of the tide towards the Republicans, but they should certainly be able to mitigate it. And political strategists are mindful at this time of year as to issues that can mitigate coming political tides. Immigration is one of those issues. We have a Bangladeshi national who is a resident alien in the United States because of chain migration attempting to blow himself up in Times Square this morning. He was thankfully unsuccessful, but he could have been successful. And there may be another person, and that person may be successful, and they all could have been stopped. They wouldn't be here but for chain migration. It is a compelling argument for the Republicans as they head into 2018. Now, you can say they're racist, you can say they're demagogues, you can say they're anti-immigrant, you can say all these things. It doesn't matter. What matters is does it resonate with the American people? And there are plenty of postings out there online, plenty of poll results online, pl plenty of all sorts of stuff online to show that, in fact, this issue resonates with the American public. And if the President of the United States continues to push this issue, this may be an issue where Republicans can mitigate what the Democrats have in store for them next year. Polling suggests immigration is an issue that does not work for Democrats the way they presume that it does. And it does not work for Democrats the way they presume that it does because they assume that we are a nation of immigrants and immigrants must therefore support immigration. But the data actually shows that the longer a legal immigrant is in the United States, the less likely that immigrant is to support present immigration law. The Democrats will need to take that under advisement, but they won't because their party has been hijacked uh, by the, the open borders, ultimate immigration radicals. And so, well, advantage Trump. Yo, so I got a problem. I'm developing my Christmas list and the, the thing that I want is too expensive for my wife to buy. So I need to win the lottery, I guess. That's that's going to be the ticket. I need a lottery ticket. for. So a, 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 I have a Sony a7R II. I love this camera. It takes brilliant pictures. And they have these two lenses out. Uh, they have the 1635 uh, GM lens, 
and they have the the 20 to 70 GM lens. Uh, GM is, is Sony's top of the line in-house lenses, and I with with large apertures, and I I want both of them, but they're each like 2100. It's horrifying. Um, I, I have crossed the point where buying things for me for Christmas will bankrupt a small country, <laughs> and I don't have the I don't have the money. I, I really need a winning lottery ticket is what I need, uh, and that would take care of everything. But until then, I'm trying to come up with reasonable stuff for me for Christmas. And the, the problem is that if I see something I like I, and I can get it, I tend to go on and get it and not wait for other people to get it for me, and then buy stuff for everyone else. But I got to tell you guys, when my oldest child figures out what she is getting for Christmas, we may need a defibrillator machine for our Christmas because she may need it when she finds out her Christmas present. And I can't tell you guys yet what I'm getting because there is a child in her sixth grade class, and I've told the parents, I think it's child abuse, but the child listens to this program with his dad. Um, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't say that, but still, uh, it, the kid willingly listens to this program. Um, and so I can't say what I'm, I, I'll tell you after Christmas when she sees it, but I'm really thinking of actually burying it under a lump of coal just cause I've been joking with her. That's what she's going to get. When we come back, Roy Moore's polling, uh, good news, bad news for him today. One poll has him way ahead. One poll, not so much. I'll tell you what the huge difference is in the polling discrepancies in Alabama when we come back. It is 39 after the hour. I am Eric Erickson. The phone number, I guess I should give you that. 404 872 WSB Talk, and I want to let you guys know something real quick. <clears throat> in January, we are going to be organizing a series of conversations with the gubernatorial candidates, Republican and Democrat, and we're going to do it in studio before a live audience in our live lounge, and if you want to participate, I will let you know on um, on the show how you can RSVP. But for our diehard listeners, those of you who have participated in action items and those of you who have subscribed to the podcast, uh, we're giving you the first bite at the apple to RSVP because space is limited. And we've invited all the gubernatorial candidates are in the process of doing so. Hunter Hill, Michael Williams, um, um, Brian Kemp, Casey Cagle, Stacey Abrams, Stacey Evans, uh, Clay Tippett. We're inviting them all in. Uh, we're focusing on Tuesday and Thursday nights. Um, if you want to get this, uh, subscribe to the podcast by texting the word show to four, 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 nine, nine, nine. And in the next few nights, starting tonight, uh, if you listen to the podcast, you will hear how to get on the advance notice for these events um, in the subscription list where you'll get the email. Um, so get the podcast and listen to it. Uh, text the word show to 444-999. Now, Roy Moore is ahead in Alabama, according to the Real Clear Politics polling average. There is a problem, though that you need to understand about the polling coming out of Alabama. And that is this. According to Fox News, um, I, where is it? Yes, um, Doug Jones is ahead by 10 percentage points. According to the Washington Post, Doug Jones is ahead by 3 percentage points. Now, why is the discrepancy? By the way, Emerson College has Roy Moore ahead by nine points. That came out today as well. So why the discrepancies? Well, the reason is because of the polling method. Now, there, there are other reasons as well. But two of the three, the CBS News YouGov poll has it Roy Moore 49, Doug Jones 43, Roy Moore six points ahead. The Fox News poll, the Washington Post poll, and the CBS News poll are the three polls that did 
two things none of the other pollsters did. They used live operators calling cell phones. Live operators calling cell phones. Now, that is very important because when you look, for example, at one of the polls, has a likely voter pool of 1,419 people, and it has Roy Moore ahead by five. That sounds really good, except when you realize it was an automated poll of landline phones. The Fox News poll and the Washington Post poll, Fox News has a likely voter pool of 1,127 likely voters, and the Washington Post has 739 likely voters. The Fox News poll has a margin of error of 3%, and it has Doug Jones ahead by 10. The Washington Post poll has a margin of error of 4.5%, has Doug Jones ahead by 3. The CBS News poll is 766 likely voters with a margin of error of 4.8%, and has Roy Moore ahead by 6. Again, uh, these are pollsters who called cell phones with live operators. You can't, there is a federal law, you cannot call a cell phone. And I know some of you get these phone calls and it's against the law for you to have gotten them. You are not allowed to call a cell phone without using a live operator. Because Congress does not want you charged for minutes for political phone calls. Yes, it sometimes happens to you, and yes, it is against the law, and yes, candidates every year get in trouble for it. The question in Alabama now is the polling model. Because here's something that Fox News and the Washington Post have both found. So here's something that they found that is very interesting. The Washington Post and um, Fox. That the enthusiasm for Roy Moore goes up when you expand the voter pool to registered voters. Now, why is that relevant? It's relevant because all of the polls, both the online polls and the on-phone polls, the live operator polls, the automated polls, they're all showing that there is a huge enthusiasm gap. Republicans like Roy Moore more than they like Doug Jones but they also show that Democrats are more engaged in the election than Republicans. So Republicans may like Roy Moore more than Doug Jones, but they are less likely to vote than the Democrats who are fired up about the race. Now, there are some people who say the Fox News poll has um, undercounted Roy Moore's strength all along. In fact, the Fox News poll has been probably one of the most pessimistic polls about Roy Moore the entire way through. But at this point, the polling is somewhat irrelevant because we will find out tomorrow whether there is Doug Mintum or Roy Mintum. And I, I just, my gut tells me it is a 50-50 race. That is what the polling shows. But if I just had to call it on the number of voters in Alabama, I would give the slight edge to Roy Moore. Even with all of the allegations, I would give the slight edge to Roy Moore in this race because Alabama is so overwhelmingly a Republican state. That being said, I do find it very interesting, and I think you should not dismiss the fact that the polls that, calls, that call um, cell phones, which not all pollsters do, by two to one, find that Doug Jones is actually winning the race. We'll find out tomorrow. Well, my goodness, when did this break? This just, yes, this just happened. This just got posted by Fox News. A senior Justice Department official demoted last week for concealing his meetings with the men behind the anti-Trump dossier had even closer ties to Fusion GPS, the firm responsible for the incendiary document, than have been disclosed, Fox News has confirmed. The official's wife worked for Fusion GPS during the 2016 election. Contacted by Fox News, investigators for the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence confirmed that Nellie Orr, wife of the demoted official Bruce Orr, worked for the opposition research firm last year. The precise nature of her duties, including whether she worked on the dossier, remain unclear, but a review of her published works available online revealed Mrs. Orr has written extensively on Russia-related subjects. 
The House Permanent Select Committee on, on Intelligence staff confirmed to Fox News that Mrs. Orr was paid by Fusion GPS through the summer and fall of 2016. Until December 6th, when Fox News began making inquiries about him, Bruce Orr held two titles at the Department of Justice. He was and remains director of the Organized Crime Drug Enforcement Task Force, but his other job was far more senior. Mr. Orr held the rank of Associate Deputy Attorney General, a post that gave him an office four doors down from Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein. The day before Fox News reported that Mr. Orr held a secret meetings last year with the founder of Fusion GPS, Glenn Simpson, and with Christopher Steele, the former British spy who compiled the dossier, the Justice Department stripped him of his deputy title and ousted him from his fourth floor office. Interesting, interesting, interesting. My goodness. And when we come back, well, we got the tax reform bill and the GOP 100% tax rate for some of you. It is 6.09. I am Eric Erickson. This is WSB. The phone number 404-872-0750, 1-800-WSB-TALK. And if you want to, well, if you want to show up at our gubernatorial interviews that we're going to be doing for the people running for governor in January and February, and you want advance notice so you can get ahead of the line to get an invitation, well, you need to start listening to the podcast, at least the intro to it, uh, and you could do so by texting the word SHOW to 444-999, and you'll see how to get on the list because we're going to give advance notice. If you've participated in an action item, this is a way to reward those of you who either uh, subscribe to the podcast or particularly those of you who do action items uh, as they come up. Um, we're giving you advance notice for when we bring all the gubernatorial candidates in and have live discussions with questions from the crowd. That begins in January, Republican and Democrat alike. We're going to invite them all in. The Republicans, <clears throat> excuse me, still getting over this cold. The Republicans have a 100% tax rate for some of you. That's right. For every dollar you earn, 100% of it will go to the federal government. I am not making this up. I wish I was. The Republicans rushed their Senate tax reform plan. And you know, last week, by the way, I was saying, man, why don't they just go on and pass the Senate tax reform plan and be done with it? Well, this is why. This is why. Because they had a typo in the legislation, and uh, some of you, if you own a small business, if you own a small business, a sole proprietorship in particular, if you own a small business that is a sole proprietorship, you will see a 100% tax rate in some cases. Now, don't worry. They're going to get rid of it. They're fixing it in conference. But that is one reason they can't rush through the uh, tax reform package because they got to fix these things in conference. They got to slow everything down. A hundred percent tax rate, y'all. And, uh, you know, there's a lesson here, and it goes back to CNN Friday evening. If you're a regular listener to this program, you know that for three years I was at CNN before I moved to Fox. I have a very great respect for the people at CNN, many of whom are of the left, but know they are of the left. And a number of their reporters and anchors worked overtime to try to compensate for their biases. I spent a lot of time, in fact, I still do. I spend a lot of time to this day talking to reporters and anchors at CNN because they'll call, they know me, and they'll say, you know, we're running this story, what's your perspective on it? Or do you have some sources we can talk to, particularly in the pro-life community? Um, they have regularly in the past um, asked me for contacts within the pro-life community, very mindful of the fact that most of the networks always put a male pro-lifer against a female uh, pro-abortion opponent. And so they've, they've wanted female pro-lifers to, to balance it out and, and keep it as neutral as possible. 
And so I have a good respect for him, but I also think they make screw-ups, and I think Chris Cuomo is a terrible, terrible liberal anchor. And on Friday, they screwed up big time. On Friday, they screwed up because they dwelled for a very long time on an email received by the Trump campaign on September 4th that turned out in September 4th of 2016 that gave them a sneak peek into the Hillary email situation. And it turns out that the email had actually come after the public release from WikiLeaks, and it came from a donor making sure they had seen it. They completely misrepresented it and spent about eight hours on national television doing this, only to have to embarrassingly correct it. And there, So there is a tie-in here that I think we can all take away from these situations, and that is slowing down. I think you can all recognize there is a desire in the media these days to be first, not right. And we're seeing this more and more with the rise of social media as reporters spend a ton of time revealing their liberal bias as well on things like Twitter. And when a story breaks, they rush out as quickly as possible trying to be first, not right. And in trying to be first, not right, what's happening is they're screwing up stories. And more and more people are taking advantage of those stories. More and more people are taking advantage of the propensity to try to be first instead of right. And they're planting planting stories with the media, knowing young reporters in particular are going to rush them out. You know, as an aside... That is one of the reasons why I think that Republicans have to be careful in dealing with the Washington Times story about the Roy Moore accusers. Because the Washington Post took a great deal of time to vet the story. And we see what happened with the rush out um, from the people who tried to set up the Washington Post that they were caught. But We also see, and I think this is important, that the Gloria Allred story, uh, she rushed it out. She rushed to the cameras without doing the vetting, and that story has blown up on that lady. I'm assuming you all know by now that the lady is now admitting that she added the date notation at the end of the Roy Moore autograph in her yearbook which raises real and plausible questions presented by Roy Moore's attorneys as to why that DA appeared after his name. Did she add that to? And if she added that to, did she get it from the, did she get it from the, the court order? On and on and on and on. Did she make the whole thing up? I mean, it's, it's a legitimate question, I think. And it undermines her case. And it is, it's a case that the Washington Post tried very hard to dot every I and cross every T on by moving slow. But most reporters out there aren't moving slow. How many stories have been retracted by the New York Times, by CNN and elsewhere? Because they rushed these scoops and it turns out that in rushing the scoops, they got major things wrong. And now we're learning, by the way, that Fusion GPS, which prepared the Russia dossier, the Christopher Steele dossier on Trump, used a bunch of reporters to help. And in using a bunch of reporters to help, they may have been rushing information from Fusion GPS that wasn't necessarily true. How many of the stories that came out in the early days of the Trump administration that were hit jobs and have been retracted, how many of them came from Fusion GPS? Because one of the many things that we're learning about Fusion GPS is they collaborated with a lot of reporters. In fact, take, for example, Neil King. So uh, let me tell you this story. Well, you know, when I come back, let me tell you the story uh, uh, about a Wall Street Journal reporter who chastised me for pointing out how many reporters are married into the Obama administration and what's happened to him. This is a fascinating sneak peek into the American media.
It's your here can hear the phone number 404-872-0750-1800 WSB Talk. Now there is CNN has just sent out a breaking news report. The bombing suspect in New York City pledged allegiance to ISIS and carried out the attack because of the Israeli actions in Gaza. So, folks, this is a a media effort here to blame Donald Trump for the terrorist attack. Donald Trump did not strap a pipe bomb to himself and try to blow himself up. And there's something else here you need to pay attention to. You don't learn how to make a pipe bomb overnight. The president, when did the president make the decision with, with Jerusalem? He did it Wednesday. Now, maybe this guy did because he did it so badly, but I have a real hard time believing that this guy only Wednesday decided uh, to pledge himself to ISIS and try to make a pipe bomb and a suicide vest and blow himself up. I have a real hard time believing that. And if you just accept it in passing, I would tell you that you need to be a more critical thinker. Because the media has been waiting for a way to spin the jury because, you know, the media was expecting an outbreak of massive political violence across the Middle East. And it hasn't happened. See, anti-Trump officials from the Obama administration knew that this was coming and they've been seeding the media landscape with stories about the coming violence in the Middle East because of Donald Trump's decision to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital, which it already is Israel's capital. But that violence didn't pan out. So now they're working overtime. They're trying to string together everything they possibly can to say this is all about the president. This is all about the president's Jerusalem decision. And it's simply not the case. It is simply not true. And I don't think we should call it true. I don't think we should embrace it as true because it's not. It is just PR spin. Now, when we come back, China is in the news and it affects some of our Georgia colleges. I'm going to get to this China story here in just a minute, but I just, now I got to stumble across this. Where is this again? Um, yes. So the New York Times has a article on the year's best baking cookbooks for novices and pros. One of the things that, one of the trends that I just despise these days is it, it is such a hipster trend that you could just got to frou-frou up every basic, decent recipe. That you, you can't just have a chocolate chip cookie recipe anymore. It is a, a chocolate nib cookie recipe with flaxseed oil sourced from an immigrant farmer from Guatemala. It is so frustrating and ridiculous. Like Martha Stewart now has a, a, in fact, let me read you this paragraph here. Martha Stewart has a new way to bake. It's more about incorporating better for you ingredients such as virgin coconut oil. How do I know if the coconut oil has had had sex or not? And flax seeds into desserts rather than drastically cutting sugar or fat. These baked goods are all for the richer tasting for the additions. Quinoa flour, which quinoa is how it's spelled. But it's quinoa flour. Adds an earthy tone to gluten-free pancakes. While a little spelt flour really does make brownies seem more chocolatey. It just, I mean, why complicate? Because where are you going to use your spelt flour and your virgin coconut oil? I'd make a Roy Moore joke there, but it would be totally inappropriate. But let me just read you this. Let me read you this paragraph. This is a single paragraph. After all. How can you resist a crunchy, sweet brittle with smoked almonds and cacao nibs, hot chocolate cookies with toasted marshmallows and Aleppo pepper, or tender thumbprints with spicy cardamom plum jam? What the heck is spicy cardamom plum jam? I am pretty sure it is not something that I want to eat. 
and Aleppo pepper? Why not just black pepper? Are we, is it racist? Now? I just, this, this, this whole cooking trend with, oh, we can find an, I mean, like the, the cat poop coffee. We can find the cat poop coffee, which is a real thing where the, 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 the wild cats had devoured the coffee beans and they digest the husk and poop out the bean and you turn it into coffee. I don't need that. I just want regular, real Recipes, recipes that my whole family can enjoy, that I don't have to spend the day online searching for some one-armed uh, troglodyte from South America who is like in some sort of field where he needs public support and is single-handedly crushing cacao beans and we got to buy the cacao from him. I don't care. Just give me good recipes. And some of these cookbooks are appalling. I intend to prepare... A, a list of gift ideas, particularly cookbooks and stuff that I've discovered this year that I like. There are some really good ones out there. It will not be any of these, I assure you. And, and I will put that up at theresurgent.com. You can go get it. You can subscribe to the show notes. Uh, you can text the word show to 444 You'll get the podcast, too, and be able to find out from the podcast how you can get advance notice of the gubernatorial candidates coming in studio with us and be a part of the studio audience and get to ask them questions. James, or uh, Josh Rogan. At the Washington Post, it, it is an opinion piece there, and it is about time to see something like this in print. Marco Rubio is the co-chairman of the Congressional Executive Commission on China. It is a um, bipartisan group that has suddenly realized China is paying big money to influence influencers in the United States. Well... They probably don't have to pay Tom Friedman because he loves him some China. But, you know, one of the red flags that Marco Rubio and this committee in Congress are raising is the Confucius Institutes on U.S. university campuses. Now, some of you around here will be familiar with them. There are Augusta University has one. Wesleyan College in Middle Georgia has one. Georgia State University has one. Uh, Kennesaw State, I believe, has a Confucius Institute. Um, let's see. Yep, it's hard to zoom in on these maps. Yes. And the question becomes, um, and Savannah State has one. Some of these institutions are of dubious nature. Let, let me just read you this from this Washington Post story. Senator Rubio pointed to Chinese government-sponsored Confucius Institutes on U.S. university campuses that operate under opaque contracts and often stand accused of interfering in China-related education activities. China's sponsorship of think tank research, academic chairs, and intellectual partnerships demands scrutiny. And that is true. China is spending a lot of money to influence American colleges and universities and American think tanks conservative and liberal alike, including the Brookings Institute and others. Trying to influence them on policymaking, trying to convince them that things are not as they seem in China. And at least finally, Democrats and Republicans in Congress are raising a red flag. And why are they raising a red flag? Because they started looking into the Russian influence in Washington, and it turns out the Chinese influence may be more. China has not attempted to influence the election like the Russians, and so has been able to better fly under the radar. But it turns out that the Chinese, CHICOM, the Communist Party in China, is spending huge amounts of money to influence American influence leaders, thought leaders on both sides, opinion writers, pundits, commentators, think tank heads, and the like. And one of the ways they're doing it is with these Confucius Institutes on college campuses around the country, a huge number of them, and also cultural exchange programs with high schools around the country, where they're sending American kids to China and getting Chinese students here, and it's a whole indoctrination process to try to make us forget how nefarious the Chinese Communist Party actually is. And at least someone's paying attention to it, but I wonder if enough, because, you know, you talk about the Confucius Institutes, and you hear from people on those college campuses. I will probably have emails from Georgia State and Augusta and, and Kennesaw and the like over their Confucius Institutes. They try to downplay the connections. But, again, they are opaque contracts. And in many cases around the country, 
these institutes are trying to convince universities to stop highlighting Chinese censorship, Chinese tyranny, Chinese abuse, their, their one-child abortion policies and the like. Keep an eye out. This story is only just now developing and it needs to develop. So uh, let me give you the lay of the land of what we're going to do next month. Uh, And we want to invite in all of the gubernatorial candidates, uh, Democrat and Republican alike. Uh, We will be fair across the board and allow them to come on and spend an hour on the radio with me and have a conversation. It, it, It will not be combative. It will be contemplative and probative of their positions and also their biography. And to spend some time uh, with those of you uh, who come to the live audience and take questions. Now, what we'll do is we will pre-screen the questions. We're not going to let people ask questions from the floor because, in my experience, uh, people tend to ramble. And some people announce they have a question and they spend their entire time on a dissertation that makes no sense. Uh, But we will be participating and allowing you guys to participate. So I hope you will stay tuned for that. Uh, make it happen. If you want advance notice, you can uh, text the word show to 444-999. And if you listen to the podcast, you'll find out how to get on the list. Uh, and I will see you guys tomorrow with more on the overnight on the Bangladeshi situation.